straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. It's the battle of the experts in a lawsuit involving a collision in the middle of a popular ski slope. He said Ms. Paltrow's was impossible, which I believe is false. I, I think Ms. Paltrow's version is possible. Details on the testimony a doctor gave that completely contradicts an apparent eyewitness. Plus, was Gwyneth Paltrow disingenuous from the start? One dollar, that's a mischaracterization, isn't it? Why the plaintiff's legal team is calling out her countersuit and what will actually be owed if she wins. And that's not all. Reports about accused killer Brian Koberger's life behind bars reveal some of the threats against him. The threat was so repetitive, so ongoing all night long, the jail facility had to take action. We're digging into the intimidation he's facing as Koberger awaits trial for the brutal murder of four college students. Law and Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everybody to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Jesse Weber. Expert witnesses took the stand on Tuesday testifying about what they believe happened on a Utah ski slope in 2016 when A-lister Gwyneth Paltrow and retired eye doctor Terry Sanderson collided. Those witnesses range from ski experts to engineers with exhibits like animations and even a physics lesson. Paltrow testified that Sanderson slammed into her back, sending her crashing to the ground. Sanderson says actually she hit him. And while she only had some knee pain that was soothed by a massage, several of his ribs were broken and he was left with an apparent brain injury. Tuesday officially marked one week of the trial. Paltrow's team created an animation of what the scene may have looked like if Sanderson was the one to ski into her that day. A biomechanical engineering group helped piece together the scenario from different angles, and Dr. Irving Shore walked us through some of it. The first thing to be aware of is um, this is Miss Paltrow's uh, version of the events, so that's what we're showing here. And um, as we move forward, I'll talk about the physics, kind of like what I drew earlier with the center of mass and the rotation, and that's the idea. That's what went into this. But again, this is not exactly what happened. This is just one of the possible ways it could have happened. In, in this portion, there's a number of possibilities. She could be adding weight to her right ski because of the contact from Mr. Sanderson. Um, when you, if she weights the, the right ski here more because of the contact, she's going to turn counterclockwise. The contact from Mr. Sanderson, if it's more to the right, will turn her counterclockwise. So as they're moving to the right here, there would be some counterclockwise rotation and here, her ski can catch, or she could pitch to the side, or they could both pitch to the side, they could both lose balance. We're not sure what happens. So as she's rotating and he's rotating counterclockwise, they fall to the side. Mr. Sanderson lands on his right side, maybe the right back. Um, it's hard, hard to say. If he lands on his right side, kind of like Dr. Bam said, you know, he needs to land on the elbow, that can happen. That can create lateral rib fractures. But that's not the only way. His arm could be out, he could land on the side and create lateral rib fractures. He could land on his side and a little bit towards the back and Miss Paltrow could land on him. As they hit the snow, they would continue to move forward until friction slows them down. And uh, it's also important to note, we haven't talked about the head injury, but hitting the back of the head or the side of the head, he, he could have his head turned. All of those are possibilities for him to contact his head on the snow. So that's not inconsistent as well. The witnesses that were called by Paltrow's team also helped rebut some of the testimony that was given when the trial started last week. Craig Ramon was part of a group skiing with Terry Sanderson at Deer Valley Resort in 2016, and he testified he had actually seen the collision and knew for sure that it was Paltrow who ran into Sanderson. But Paltrow, who was on a ski trip with her family, said just the complete opposite, and the expert ended up agreeing with her. Take a listen to what Ramon said and how the engineer reacted to it on Tuesday. And then I heard this, this, this yell, this, this, this scream, and then I looked over, and then about, you know, maybe one or two seconds, um, and then I heard the scream, and then, and then, and then I see this, this, this skier just slam into the back of Terry, 
and when and she just slammed him. How hard? Very hard. He, he, I mean, very hard. And so Terry, he, she hits him right directly in the back. And so then, uh, then his skis are like when you're skiing, you're skiing like this. His skis, his skis actually the tips go out like this, and he falls <laughs> face down. So he's he's kind of he's kind of spread eagle. And he goes face down, and, and Gwyneth's on the top of him, and, and they go down like this, and then Gwyneth hits him, and then bounces off and slides to the right about five or ten feet. Well, Mr. Ramon's account is very different, because in Mr. Ramon's account, uh, Mr. Sanderson goes spread eagle, and his skis go out into that V, and the inside edges catch, and that changes the kinematics, the motion. Um, it's a very different version of what happens with the contact. All right, joining me right now are my co-hosts, former trial attorney Terry Austin, defense attorney Brian Buckmeyer. Brian, it is a battle of the biomechanical experts. Who do you think won? Jesse, full disclosure, physics was not my strongest science <laughs> in school, but this is what I have to say. I think that Paltrow's side is winning because her stories match up. What Paltrow is saying matches up with her experts, matches up with the science of what they're arguing, as well as the eyewitness account, that of Paltrow's. On the other side, Sanderson's testimony, it doesn't make sense that he, that he got hit, according to Ramon, and went straight down rather than sliding down. And Sanderson says he went flying. His expert says that's not possible. Ramon doesn't say that he went flying. So even on Sanderson's sides alone, there's a lot of contradicting statements. On Paltrow's, it's smooth sailing from the top of the hill to the bottom. So mm. her side seems to make a lot more sense. Brian is going to miss these puns when this trial is ultimately <laughs> over. Uh, Terry, you mentioned that the jury might be confused about who hit whom if Paltrow ended up on top of Sanderson. You think the biomechanics expert cleared that up? Oh, he certainly did. In the beginning, I do think the jury may have been confused because when you think about it, the person in the back is going to fall on top of the person in the front. But I think that the characterization of how it happened made complete sense, as Brian said. If someone is coming from behind you and you back into them and it turns out you fall forward, they fall, it, you're going to end up on top if, you know, she fell the way she said she fell. So I definitely think that the characterization and that the, you know, the mechanics explanation made a lot of sense to that jury. And by the way, I don't think the jury can actually use that video as evidence. It's used to help guide them, right. but it's more of a, you know, a demonstrative exhibit for like them. Like ski poles. Like ski poles. There we go. <laughs> Brian's going to miss this case. Still ahead on Long Crime Daily. What are Paltrow and Sanderson looking to get out of this trial? Well, why the plaintiff's lawyers are taking aim at Gwyneth Paltrow's request as money remains at the forefront of many minds. Welcome back to Long Crime Daily, everybody. As Terry Sanderson's legal team tries to fight back against what actress Gwyneth Paltrow's squad has presented during a civil trial, there's something that's been brought up time and again. Money. You see, Sanderson is suing the celebrity for at least $300,000 in damages. It's up in the air how much he could actually get, but his lawyers say the case is worth several million dollars. In a countersuit, Paltrow sued for just $1 plus attorney's fees. When Paltrow was on the stand Friday, she was asked about that. And then on Tuesday, after offering testimony on biomechanics and physics, one of Sanderson's attorneys questioned how much the expert witness was being paid. It's not true, Ms. Paltrow, that you are just asking for a dollar. You are also asking, and this is not for the jury to decide, but this is for the court to decide later, you're asking for your attorney's fees in this case, which could be quite substantial. Is that not true? So it's I'm a yes, asking it's a yes for a no. dollar for me mm -hmm. and then reimbursement of attorney's fees, which is a separate thing. And that could be a substantial amount, correct? Potentially. Okay. And when your counsel got up waving that one dollar, don't you think that's a little bit of a mischaracterization? I took it as I would receive that one dollar, which is all I am asking for. Okay. You're being paid, uh, what is it, four twenty-five an hour for this? No. Um, is it more than four twenty-five an hour? It is. Um, four fifty an hour? No. Nope. Five hundred? It's five hundred an hour. Five hundred an hour. And uh, you build something over ten thousand dollars so far for your work? That sounds about right. More than fifteen thousand? No, I don't think so. 
So between ten and 15000 And Brian, you got some strong feelings about this. I mean, what is wrong with asking for the other party to cover attorney's fees? Do it. By all means, there's no law against it. But as a person who fundamentally believes that a person should have a defense regardless of how much money they have in their pocket, statutes are specifically written so that if someone goes after you, whether you are the janitor in a building or the CEO of the building, that you will not have to be out of pocket for frivolous lawsuits because you have to pay for your own attorneys. Imagine uh, you are a small business owner and someone comes in and falsifies a slip and fall and they say, I'm going to sue you you for $8,000. You'd be like, oh man, I've got to hire an attorney for $10,000. And if I can't get those legal fees, even though that I know that I'm right, I'm going to be out of pocket. So I might as well pay this person $8,000. That's why this is written into statutes to protect people. So to make it seem like she's a money grabbing, uh, yeah. high fluent person, I think it's horrible and disingenuous to do that as an attorney. I, I agree, Brian. And Terry, just going back for a second, you think that, uh, do you think that T Sanderson's team made any points by cross-examining the biomechanical expert? I think he made no points at all whatsoever. <laughs> Even the point we just saw about how much he's getting paid, of course he has to get paid, and it wasn't an astronomical amount that he talked about. 400, 500, that is reasonable. But I think when you have an expert like Dr. Shear, who was amazing on the stand, he was easy to understand, he talked directly to that jury, he was professorial in nature, he made it very clear. And the first thing he started out saying was, look, the formula that Sanderson's expert used was wrong. And so everything else from that was wrong. And he made things very clear for that jury to understand that the way Gwyneth Paltrow did say that the accident happened was the way mechanically it could have happened with that biomechanical well, you know, expertise that he has. I hope the jurors are a lot smarter than me because I was lost at certain points. But I'll tell you what, coming up on Long Crime Daily, our coverage of Sanderson versus Paltrow continues. Plaintiff Terry Sanderson takes the stand in the civil case. What he described that had many at the defense table looking surprised and confused. back everybody we're continuing to cover the high profile civil trial involving actress and businesswoman Gwyneth Paltrow and right now we're taking a closer look at the plaintiff Terry Sanderson who testified on Monday Sanderson took his opportunity to challenge the claims that Paltrow made when she took the stand when she essentially blamed Sanderson for the entire incident and during the plaintiff's description of the event he caused quite a few eyebrow raises at the defense table check it out I just remember Everything was great, and then I heard something I've never heard at a ski resort, and that was a blood-curdling scream. Just, I can't do it. It was, ah, and then, boom. And it was like somebody was out of control and going to hit a tree and was going to die. And that's what I had until I was hit. That's what was going on in your mind. Overruled. That's what's going on in your mind when you hear that scream. At, that was instantaneous. Oh my gosh, somebody's out of control. And they're really seriously out of control. Not time for a hockey stop. I didn't go think about that, but most people could avoid that, I think. Good skiers. Okay. okay. And I'll move on. Okay. So you. you All right, I think it overruled. He's overruled. Thank you. So you hear this scream. Yes. What happens next? You know, I got hit in my back so hard and it, I, I'm right at my shoulder blades and it felt like and was perfectly centered and the, the fists and the poles were right there at the bottom of my shoulder blades. Serious, serious smack. Never been hit that hard and I'm flying. I'm absolutely flying. Now, you're not airborne. Well, it, all I saw was a whole lot of snow, and I didn't see the sky. So, Terry, Paltrow's team, they objected when Sanderson testified about the scream like that. The judge overruled it. You think that was the right decision, or just let him talk about it? Well, you know, I think that decision could have gone either way, but I do think it was the right decision. The objection was because Sanderson was trying to say what was in the mind of the person who was screaming. But the way he worded it and what his attorney or was trying to get out there was 
that was what was in Sanderson's mind. So he heard the scream, and in his mind, he thought it meant someone was coming down the slope and they were screaming because they were afraid they were going to have a collision. That's acceptable under the rules of evidence. He can't say what someone else is thinking, but he can certainly say how that scream made him feel and what he thought might have been going through someone else's mind because that's what he was thinking at the time. It's a very dicey decision, but I think it was probably the right one. Yeah, and Brian, I, I don't think it was a mistake that when he said the scream sounded like someone was out of control. That was very specific language. It's like saying, oh, the way he killed him was premeditated. You know, it, it felt a little bit like a win for Sanderson there. It all depends. It, it depends, I think, because we're getting to the point in the case where what are the lawyers going to do come summation to try to win this case based on their ability to articulate what this evidence means? Now, could Paltrow's attorneys come up and say, what does a scream sound like to you, the jury, when someone's out of control and about to hit a tree? Do you know what that is? Sanderson didn't describe it. He's trying to pull that out of thin air because he needs it to show that she was reckless. Is there any evidence that says that Gwyneth Paltrow was skiing recklessly? No. That's his Hail Mary pass to try to win this case. On the other end, it could be, do you know what this scream sounds like? And people say, yeah, I understand what it is. And of course he's able to do that because Paltrow was able to do it, but it's a lot different for a woman to say, a man touched me and it felt like I was being sexually assaulted as my mind was progressing. Mm. And for him to say, well, this scream was like. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't save himself as much as his lawyers thought he did. All right, more discussion with this, but when we come back, we're actually gonna switch gears. Accused quadruple murderer Brian Koberger is still in an Idaho jail as he awaits his preliminary hearing, and despite being cut off from most inmates, life is far from easy for him. We're gonna look at a new report from inside the jail. That's next. Plenty more Paltrow Sanderson coverage this week with Paltrow's defense case underway. But right now, I want to switch gears to another high profile case that we're covering, and that is Brian Koberger, the man charged in the murders of the Idaho Four. Now, Koberger's preliminary hearing is scheduled for late June, but in the meantime, he's been booked in the Latak County Jail in Moscow, Idaho, since early January. And sources say that jail life hasn't been so easy for the accused killer, even in segregation. News Nation has the exclusive report in, on a one-on-one -on -one inmate in general population threatening Koberger through the walls. Boy, did Brian Koberger get an earful. The night that inmate was brought into the Latow County Jail, he was up all night, our exclusive sourcing tells us, sourced with intimate knowledge of Brian Koberger in jail, says the threats were nonstop. Let me just read them for you. I'm going to kill you, Koberger. Direct quote from this new inmate through the walls and through the doors, which Brian Koberger could hear. And it wasn't just once, it was all night long. And when that wasn't enough, that inmate decided to change course and target the guards, saying, I'll get Koberger to kill you. And that is also a quote. Those guards had to actually move this inmate, although in 2,000 square feet, I'm not exactly sure where you could move them. Uh, but the threat was so repetitive, so ongoing all night long, the jail facility had to take action. Terry, on the one hand, death threats, they should be taken very seriously, right? But now, Koberger has his own private cell. Was that the right solution? I think it's one of the only solutions that they could do is to put him in his own cell. And it does seem as though it's an advantage for him. As a matter of fact, there are some people who want to have private cells and who try to make reasons for the security to put them in their own cell here. He has his own television. He doesn't have to share it with other people, whereas the other inmates apparently do. He also, if you recall, is a vegan, and he gets served these meals that others aren't getting served, so it's probably fresher. So I think all in all, it's a slight advantage to him. He's now in jail, so he's waiting and holding until he has his trial and he is or isn't convicted. So this is just for a temporary time period. But for this time period, it does seem as though he's getting the best of what he could possibly get because he now does have his own private cell and they do have to protect him. It's very serious when you get threats like that. But, but Brian, this is jail. I mean, this stuff happens. Should we be that concerned about these types of issues for him? 
Yeah, Jesse, I know we have a lot of flack for this, but um, I'm going to put on my public defender hat. Yes, we should be. First of all, there's a big difference between jail and prison. Prison is where you are punished after you're convicted. Jail is where you're being held while you're innocent until proven guilty, until those charges or unless those charges are proven. We have to make sure that the rights and the protections of all people until they are convicted and get their just punishment are protected. It reminds me of a poem, the reason why I became a public defender, the they came for poem, where I'm not going to say the whole poem, but the idea being is first they came for the socialists, and I said nothing because I'm not a socialist. Then they came for the communists, same thing. Then they came after the Jewish people, and I said nothing because I'm not Jewish. Then they came for me, and no one was left to speak for me. I think if we let this slippery slope of, oh, they're just in jail, they're just convicted, they're just tall, they're just short, they're just white, they're just black, if we allow this concept to permeate, then who is going to be protected against things that should not happen to people? So for me, I draw the line of the accused. I think that they should all get protection until, unless and until they're convicted, and then appropriate punishment should be given. And that is why Brian Buckmeyer is a great, great attorney. So well said. I don't think I have anything more to add. Brian, Terry, thank you both so much. Everyone out there, thanks for joining us here on Long Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.